I apologize to my friends in the audience for not showing all the details. Uh, we'll skip through the disclaimer, since I think you've heard that, and go on to the presentation itself. As I mentioned, there are two portions, writing and submitting. And in the writing portion, I'm going to give you specific do's and don'ts with excerpts from these two studies recently published in AJSM, a randomized trial by Alan Getgood and his colleagues that compared ACL reconstruction with lateral extraarticular tenodesis with isolated ACL reconstruction, and another randomized trial from Martha Murray from Harvard that compared her bare enhanced ACL repair technique with ACL reconstruction, both of these being done in young susceptible patients. Going through the paper, we're going to start with the abstract, which as I mentioned, should be a miniature version of the paper. So as you're writing the abstract, remember this. So always do write the abstract last to make sure that the abstract actually and accurately reflects the content of the main paper. Another important do is to follow the format of the journal that you ultimately decide to submit the paper to. Because remember, many journals have a specific format, often a template that they want you to fill out. And if you don't follow the journal format, one of two bad things will happen. Possibly the reviewers will see this and will they'll think that you're just a very sloppy researcher or you didn't bother to read the instructions for authors. Or maybe even worse, they may think that you have already submitted the paper to a different journal that required a different format, forgot to reformat the abstract after your paper was rejected by the other journal. So always remember to follow the format of that journal. Another important do is do include the most important results of your study. Don't just include a few vague statements. Here's an example from Alan Getgood of what I mean. A total of 45 patients experienced graft rupture, 34 of 298 or 11% in the ACLR group compared with 11 of 291 or 4% in the ACL lateral extraarticular group. And then he goes on to give the risk ratio and the statistical analysis. So in one sentence, he has the most important results. He gives the readers a feeling for the magnitude of the difference and the statistical significance. As you write the abstract, do make sure that the content matches the text of the paper. For example, in the data, the most important data will be reported in maybe two or three places, in the abstract, in the text of the paper, and probably in tables or graphs that you include in the paper. And if the data don't appear to be exactly the same in all three places, it gives the reviewers the feeling that you are very sloppy or maybe that your data are not reliable. Also make sure that the conclusions of the abstract are the same as the conclusions of the main paper itself. And as you write the abstract, an important don't is don't make any conclusions not supported by your actual findings. It's very tempting to a writer to want to put things in that they believe are true or that they know are true but they didn't happen to study in that particular study. Avoid doing this, especially in the abstract. Let's move on to the introduction. The introduction is a short but important part of the paper because it sets the stage for your study. As you write the introduction, there are a number of important do's and don'ts. Do get right into the heart of the issue. Don't waste time and lose focus by talking in generalities about the subject, get right to the specific issue that you investigated. Don't include any extraneous information. The introduction should focus the reader like a laser right on your topic of investigation. Another important do for the introduction is do explain why the study will be important and useful. Obviously, you should have thought of, thought of this when you plan the study, but nevertheless, you need to communicate to the reader and to the reviewers why the findings of study will be important to knowledge and to clinical practice. Don't 
just say it's never been done before. That's not an adequate reason for doing a study. It may have never been done before because people just aren't interested in knowing the answer to that issue or it's considered a minor issue or the answer seems to be obvious. So we really want to sell the reader and the reviewers on why the findings of your study will be clinically important. And finally, in the introduction, do finish with a specific hypothesis and one that makes sense. Don't just dredge up some finding that happened to be statistically significant and say this is your hypothesis. Here's an example from Martha Murray's paper. The primary hypothesis was that patients treated with BEAR would have non-inferior patient-reported outcomes on the IKDC subjective score and APA lax AP knee laxity as compared with patients undergoing autographed ACLR reconstruction at two-year follow-up. So in one sense, she really has a very specific hypothesis and explains to the reader what she's looking for, and it's something that is provable, and she will get back to this during the paper. Okay, let's move on to the methods section of the paper. It's certainly a very important part because it explains to the reader what you did. And it's important that you have enough information that you can convince the reviewers that you actually were able to answer the question or address the hypothesis that you asked at the beginning of the paper. As in the other parts, there are a number of important do's and don'ts. Do use logical order as you write the methods. Generally, these are going to be a chronological order in which you did the various parts of the study. Excuse me, Bruce, can I interrupt? Your voice is not great. Uh, do you have earphone? Or you can come a little closer? I can come closer. Is this better? Yeah, yeah better. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Do report the dates of your study. If you did surgery on patients, it's important to report the dates in which the study was done. This helps the readers and the reviewers to put it in perspective of what's going on in the literature. Do list the surgical indications. This is something that's often unfortunately left out of many surgical studies. An author will say, I'm reporting my 200 uh, ACL reconstructions or my 200 rotator cuff repairs, but they don't ever say what the indications were for doing the surgery. And if they don't say that, then it's hard to know and hard to put in perspective the outcomes of the surgery. Uh, do list how treatment was allocated. As we know in a randomized trial, treatment is allocated randomly. But in other studies, it's important to explain exactly how you allocated treatment if you're comparing two treatments. For example, you might be comparing two surgical techniques that you did at the same time, uh, and why did you do two different surgeries? Well, it could be you had different indications. It could be one surgeon did one technique and one did another. Or it could be that you did one technique for a certain number of years, you didn't like it, and then you changed to the other technique. It's important always to explain this to the readers. Do explain how you arrived at your sample size if you're comparing two uh, groups of patients especially. Uh, obviously, if it's a case series, and you may just be including all the patients that you did during that period of time, that's important to include too. And of course, always explain your statistics. In all cases, don't obscure any important details of the methods, because it's important that the methods be in enough detail that another researcher, if they wanted to, could repeat the experiment. Now, here's an example from Alan Getgood, how he clearly described his patient population and his indications for surgery. Patients were approached for participation. If they were between 14 and 25 years of old, years old, had an ACL deficient knee, and were thought to be at high risk of injury based upon the presence of two or more of the following factors. And then he went on to list a number of factors. So he clearly described what patients he included in the study. Uh, Bruce, sorry to interrupt you again. I am told that uh, the 
voice on YouTube is not coming clear. Do you have a microphone or something? I do. If I put on my microphone, I will not be able to hear you. Raju, sir, we can hear very clearly. Uh, no, uh, Dr. IPS, Dr. IPS Oberai has just told me that it is not coming clearly on YouTube. Dr. Ryder, would you mind trying to maximize the volume on your laptop or PC, please? Let's try that. Okay, I will do that first. Yeah. Okay. Please continue when you're ready. How is this? Is this any better? Uh, please continue and we'll just check it on the YouTube link. Thank you. Okay. So it's good on YouTube now. It's good on YouTube now, sir. Please continue. Okay. So I was about to give an exam. I gave the example from Alan Getgood of the details that he placed in the abstract. Uh, sorry, I'm a little my I'm a little discoordinated here. So here we go. Okay. I gave just gave you the details from Alan Getgood on how he described the patients that he used in the study. Uh, yeah. Perfect, thank you. Please continue. Okay, hold on a second. I'm not, I've got a duplicate presentation here. Okay. Uh. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Okay. Apologies for the interference because of the technical issue. No, that's okay. Yeah. Yes, you're back on. Thank you. First line. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to go back to where I was. Sorry. Uh, there's something glitchy going on here. Um, uh, Sandeep? Uh, I think, uh... Is this supposed to be towards the end of your talk, Dr. Ryder? No, I think it's, no, in, this it's in the middle. Okay, right. Uh, okay. Sandeep is, because he can... Pradeep? I think as I don't know. Dr. Ryder, can you start uh, sharing the screen uh, again? No, no. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Can yep. you see the results? Uh, yep. Thank you. Dr. Okay. Ryder, you have to unscreen and uh, this is in presenter's mode. You have to unshare your screen and redo it again. Okay. Stop share.
How's that? Perfect, perfect. Please continue. Uh, okay. So let's move on to the results. Obviously, this is an important part of your study because it reports the findings. There are a number of important do's and don'ts in reporting your results. First, do address your hypothesis. Someplace near the beginning of the results include the, study, the results that actually address your hypothesis and tell the readers whether or not you supported or refuted your hypothesis. Here's an example from Alan Getgood's paper. In the ACLR group, 120 of 298 or 40% of patients sustained the primary outcome of ACLR clinical failure compared with 72 of 291 or 25% patients in the lateral extraarticular group. And then of course he goes on with the statistics. So right here, he clearly states the answer to his primary hypothesis in which he happened to show that the lateral extraarticular seemed to reduce the percentage of clinical failure to a clinically and uh, statistically significant degree. Do report your results in the same order as you reported the various parts of the study and the methods. This makes it much easier for the readers and the reviewers to follow your results and make sure that they're complete. Certainly, these, res these results can get very involved and lengthy. So report the clinical results in tables and then report the main highlights in the text of the paper. Now, as you write your results, it's tempting to want to leave out or at least de-emphasize some of the results that you don't like or maybe don't agree with your personal uh, practice or hypothesis. Avoid doing this as scientific publication should com be completely transparent and reviewers will pick this up and think that you're trying to de-emphasize some of the perhaps important parts of your findings. Another big don't is don't elevate unimportant findings that you see along the way. Sometimes authors will find something that happens to be statistically significant that really isn't an important outcome of the study, and yet uh, they try to emphasize it because it is statistically significant. And finally, another important don't in reporting results is don't report comparisons that are not significant as being differences. Now, it's quite possible that some secondary outcomes of your study might be underpowered, and there might be some clinically important differences that you weren't able to prove statistically. Nevertheless, this is something you can address in the discussion, but you should not discuss them as differences if they were not statistically significantly different. And then finally, as you write up the results, again, make sure the results in the paper match the results in the abstract. Now, finally, another important thing that you should do in the results is show the patient flow in any clinical study. Now, this happens to be a so-called consort flow diagram that Alan Getgood used in his study to show how the patients were solicited for participation, how many opted out for various reasons, and then how many were in each charm of the study. Many people think this is only relevant for randomized controlled trials, but that is not true. A flow diagram like this is helpful in any clinical study to clearly show to the reviewers and ultimately the readers how many patients participated in each portion and how many were lost to follow up. Let's move on to the discussion. Uh, this is another important part of the paper because it places your findings in context. As you write the discussion, do start by briefly restating your most important findings. Not all the findings, but the most important ones. Do explain the clinical importance of your findings. Uh, every study needs to have some clinical relevance, even a basic science study. And as you do this, don't tout statistically significant differences that are clinically unimportant. There is nothing that reviewers and editors re admire more if an author is willing to say something like, well, this difference was statistically significant, but it's so small 
it's not clinically important. Do compare your findings with the literature. This is an important aspect of the discussion. And as you do this, make sure if there are discrepancies between your findings and other major studies in the literature that you make an attempt to explain them, even if it's hard to be certain why the findings are different. Do report the strengths and weaknesses of your study. Every author is happy to emphasize the strengths of the study, but sometimes shies away from reporting the weaknesses. But every study has weaknesses, even the best randomized controlled trials. Here's such a statement from Martha Murray. There were several study limitations. While the two to one ratio enabled enrollment of a larger number of patients, it also led to the enrollment of only 35 patients in the ACLR group. So avoid discussing the weaknesses of your study is something that you should never do. Always report the strengths and weaknesses. Don't avoid discussing them. This gives you the opportunity to put the weaknesses into perspective. Otherwise, if you avoid discussing the weaknesses, reviewers are left to draw their own conclusions and to think maybe you wanted to obscure the weaknesses or you just weren't aware of them. Finally, the last section of the paper, usually just a few sentences, are the conclusions. As you write the conclusions, do write a concise, factual summary of your findings and don't include anything you didn't prove in your study. Here's the conclusion of Alan Getgood's study. The addition of LET, lateral extraarticular tenodesis, to a single bundle hamstring tendon autograft of ACLR in young patients at high risk of failure results in a statistically significant, clinically relevant reduction in graft rupture and persistent rotatory laxity at two years postoperatively. So the essence of all his findings in one sentence. Finally, you finish the paper, but you need to write the references. This can be boring, but it should be done properly. Do make sure the references are up to date. It's possible you last assembled your reference list when you started the study maybe a few years ago. So make sure you survey the literature and put in any new references that may be relevant. Do follow the format for that particular journal. Most journals have a specific way they want you to report the references, the most common being either in the order in which they appear in the paper or in alphabetical order. Just as in the abstract, if you don't follow the format of the journal, you'll either give the impression that you're very sloppy, didn't read the instructions for authors, or maybe the paper's already been rejected by a different journal. As you write the references, don't make citation errors. There's nothing more irritating for reviewers than trying to find a, recite, a cited reference that's incorrectly cited. And no one wants their reviewers to be irritated when they're reading their paper. Now, you think you're done writing the paper, but you're not quite ready to submit it because you need to polish your work. And there are three techniques that I recommend for polishing up your paper. And I really recommend you use all three of them. First of all, just put it away for a week and then review it again. It's amazing no matter how many times you have read through the paper, how many mistakes and errors you will pick up if you just get a fresh look at it after not thinking about it for a while. Another technique I recommend that you use is to give it to a colleague to review. And make sure this is a colleague who is able and willing to tell you the truth and tell you if there are areas that need to be improved. And finally, I recommended that you give it to a good writer to review so they can look over and see if there are any areas that could be written better or maybe clarified for the reviewers and ultimately the readers. Okay, now that you've done that, I think we're ready to move on to the submission process. It's important to think about various things as you're selecting the journal that you're going to submit the paper to. First of all, what audience do you want to reach? Is this of great general interest that you want to submit it to a general medicine journal, such as the Lancet maybe, or the New England Journal of Medicine? 
or maybe it would interest all orthopedic sur journal, uh, all orthopedic surgeons. So you want to submit it to a journal such as the Bone and Joint Journal, a very general orthopedic journal. Or finally, you may want to submit to an orthopedic specialty journal, such as the New Journal of the Indian Arthroscopy Society, or perhaps a sports medicine journal. And then, of course, you need to decide if you're going to submit to a subscription or an open access journal. Both of these types have their advantages and disadvantages. Once you select a possible candidate journal, look at specific aspects of the journal to make sure it's the right journal for your paper. Look at several issues of the journal. Look at the subject matter and ask yourself if the subject matter of your paper is something that the journal covers. Look at the study design. There's certain study designs such as case reports, uh, opinion surveys, technique papers that not all journals publish. So you're wasting your time in the journal's time if you submit such a paper to a journal that does not publish that type of design. You might also think of the difficulty of acceptance of your paper in that journal. Although in general, I advise you the first time you submit your paper to any journal, choose the journal that you think would be the absolute best home for your paper. The worst thing that can happen is that your paper will be rejected, but you'll usually get valuable comments that will help you improve it as you submit it to the next journal. So you submit the paper and then you wait. And you might just be waiting for a few weeks or a few months, depending upon how efficient the review process at that particular journal is. Finally, the decision arrives. And what might it be? Well, the most likely thing is that your paper has been rejected. This seems harsh, but most established journals have to reject the majority of papers that are submitted to them. But don't feel bad, you have plenty of company. This illustration on the right is a letter of rejection from the journal Nature sent to an author who went on to receive the Nobel Prize in Biology. So if your paper is rejected, you have plenty of good and distinguished company. Now, a much more favorable response would be that you're asked to do a revision. There are different types of revision letters. One is almost applying that your paper is guaranteed to be accepted. You just have to make a few minor changes. This is often called a minor revision letter. Another will be a little bit more indefinite. It will apply that acceptance is possible, but major changes are needed and the paper still could be rejected. The last and least likely decision is that your paper is accepted. I only say least likely because it's unlikely that your paper will be accepted the first time through. It usually needs to go through revisions. Very few papers are accepted without revisions. Now it's important to remember, every study has positives and negatives. As I pointed out, even the best randomized trial has limitations. And every study has some negatives that will be weighed by the reviewers and ultimately the editor. Ultimately, however, there can't be a decision in the middle. It has to be a yes or a no decision. Either the paper is accepted or it isn't. So many studies with many, many excellent characteristics still are rejected. If your paper is rejected, let's spend a little time thinking about why that might be. Certainly one common type of reason for rejection is that the reviewers thought it had a fatal flaw. Now there's an old saying that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Here we see a girl, she has freckles. Some people think that this is a flaw and some people think that this makes her more beautiful and interesting. So remember that fatality of a flaw or limitation can vary from one reviewer to another, from one journal to another, and even within a journal by topic. Usually a more common topic will be judged more strictly than a less common topic. What are some common flaws that could lead to rejection of a paper? The reviewers may just decide that your paper is not novel enough. There are already authored papers in the literature, uh, maybe even a better design that proved this. Second, they may decide that, decide that there's some design problems. 
in your study. Maybe they think you should have had a control or the evaluation should have been blinded and you didn't do these things. They might decide that there's just too little information in your study. Maybe because you did a retrospective study, you didn't have preoperative data or you didn't use validated outcome measures. Maybe they think you should have had imaging such as perhaps ultrasound or MRI to show whether your rotator cuff repairs actually heal. You might have not have thought this was important, but the reviewers did. The reviewers might have thought that there were some problems in the execution of your study. Perhaps you lost in their mind too many patients to follow up, or they feel that the treatment allocation was biased. Maybe the more favorably prognostic patients did had one treatment and the ones with a less favorable prognosis had another treatment. It's possible the reviewers will recommend rejection of your paper because they feel the reporting is not well done. They may feel that important details of the study are missing or that your text is disorganized or hard to follow or that the writing is difficult to understand. Uh, all these emphasize the importance of the polishing process that I talked about a little while ago. Another possible reason for rejection of the paper is that the reviewers decided that you made inappropriate conclusions. They may look and decide that your conclusions just don't match your results. Here in this photo is a girl, she's wearing rags, and then she looks at herself in the mirror and she thinks she's in a beautiful ball gown. This is an, an analogy of what we often do as surgeons. We don't want to admit that our outcomes might just be average or not as good as we had hoped. So despite the results of the study, we try to build them up in our conclusions. And this will sometimes uh, make the reviewers decide that your paper just isn't worth publishing because they don't want to argue with you on your outcomes. Another inappropriate conclusion that could cause your paper to be rejected is if you overemphasize minor outcomes or small differences that really are not that important in the study. Another major for rejection is that your study was judged by the reviewers to have too little information. They might decide that the findings are just obvious. Uh, the study is well done, but it really wasn't important to, re to prove that particular issue. They may decide your findings are not original enough. There are already other studies in the literature or maybe in that particular journal of similar content. They might decide the topic that you investigated just isn't important enough. You did a great job, but they just didn't think it was that important and they didn't think it should be in their journal. Finally, they may have decided that the salami was sliced too thin. Here in the photo, we see an Italian sausage called a salami and it's traditional to slice it off into very thin slices. This is a jargon term that editors sometimes use to talk about the uh, process of taking a body of research and slicing it up into many small bits to maximize the number of papers that the authors can get out of their research. This is not strictly unethical, but you run the risk if you make too many thin slices that the reviewers will decide there's just not enough information in that particular paper, that particular slice. Another reason for rejection is that you submitted the paper to the wrong journal. So as we talked about before, it's important to look at the topics that are published in that journal and make sure yours is within the journal's domain and look at the article types and make sure if you're, if you're sending in a case report, a technique article or an opinion survey that the journal actually publishes articles of that type. Final reason for rejection is one that can occur but probably not as often as most authors think. And that's that the reviewers failed and in their job. Either they misunderstood the paper or even worse, they were biased because the paper didn't support their own ideas. Now, can this occur? Obviously it can occur. And I think it's an important part of the job description of an editor to detect this when it occurs 
and to eliminate consideration of those reviews. Nevertheless, they sometimes can slip through, although not maybe as often as we might think. Well, your paper has been rejected. What should you do? The first thing is to calm down. Don't write a nasty letter back to the editor that day. Instead, relax, think about it for a week, and then look at it again when you're more calm. You'll need to look at the reviewer's criticisms and decide which have merit, because you want to address as many of these criticisms as possible before submitting your paper to another journal. Now, rarely, if you really think the reviewers misunderstood your paper or were biased, you might ask for reconsideration. I would do this very, very seldom. I did it twice uh, during my earlier career and successfully, I might say. But it's important not just to look at areas where the reviewers might have made a mistake, but look at all their comments and see which ones might have been accurate. Okay, a more happy outcome. You've been asked to revise the paper. Obviously, this will often lead to, to acceptance. So you should be pretty satisfied. Again, you need to decide which criticisms have merit and remedy as many of these as possible before submitting your revision. Now, if it's not possible to remedy some of these things or you think it will be too much work, then you might want to revise and submit the paper to another journal. I wouldn't advise doing this often as when you've been asked to do a revision for a journal, it usually means you have a foot in the door, so to speak, and a good chance of acceptance. But occasionally, if you, if you decide I really can't do the things the reviewers want, you might just use their advice, but submit the paper to a different journal. Now, in general, if you make the changes requested by the reviewers, your paper is going to be accepted. If you debate them, as Richard Nixon and Nikita Khrushchev are debating here, your acceptance is less predictable. Nevertheless, this is something you may have to do sometimes if you think the reviewers got it wrong. Always be sure to support your position as much as you can with references from the literature. Now, when you do your revisions, make sure you do them promptly because your paper may become dated or less important if you wait too long. As you do the revisions, copy and paste each of the comments of the reviewers and then write your answers underneath. And make sure you make those changes in the paper. Sometimes authors seem to think that the comments are only for the benefit of the reviewers. The reviewers are actually standing in for the ultimate readers. So you want to make those changes in the papers so the reader can see them. As you do these changes, highlight them in the manuscript to make it easier and more efficient for the reviewers and the editor to see what you changed. Well, congratulations. You did this. Maybe you had to revise it a few times, but your paper has been accepted. But don't completely relax. You're not completely done. You're going to receive proofs of your paper. And it's important to read them carefully and promptly. If you don't return the proofs quickly, you may delay the publication of your paper to a later issue of the journal. Check carefully for errors. This is your last chance to correct the paper. There could be mistakes in the names or titles. You will be amazed at how often after a paper is published, authors come to us and say, Oh, you left out my middle name. You got my name wrong. The authors are in the wrong order. You got our titles or our, our affiliations wrong. These are things that, that people often sort of gloss over when they're reading the, the proofs because they think that they know this stuff. Make sure it's correct. Make sure, again, that the data are correct and the same in all parts of the paper. And be sure to respond to queries from the top, from the proofreaders and the copy editors. It's important to answer every question. And remember, there could be mistakes in the paper that you made. There could be mistakes that the copy editors made as they were putting your paper to type. So look at it very carefully so you can correct these before it becomes public. Now, I know I've gone through a number of topics. 
uh, and I want to leave time for discussion and questions, so we're going to go on to that in a second. I just want to give you a few take-home messages of my keys to publication success. First, write up the results of your study clearly and objectively and present them in an organized and even-handed fashion. Submit your paper to an appropriate journal. Don't be discouraged if your paper is rejected because you have plenty of company and it gives you an opportunity to further improve your paper. And always follow through on revisions in an organized, conscientious, and timely manner. Thank you very much for your attention and for the opportunity to be part of the Indian Arthroscopy Society this evening. And thank you very much to my host. And now I throw the floor open to questions. Thank you, Bruce, uh, for a wonderful uh, overview of uh, uh, research and publication. Um, can I start asking uh, uh, the question first? You know, in India, there are lots of problems which uh, Western world don't see um, uh, in research and publication. And the most important, as an editor, I can uh, tell you is, one is English uh, writing. We think in Indian, our native language and try to write in English. That makes a lot of uh, problems when uh, it goes to an English or American journal and we get very poor remarks on our English editing. And if we, uh, and then, then it is suggested that it goes for English editing, which is quite expensive for us to do. So well, what are the solutions for that? Second is now high impact journals like AJSM, uh, etc., are mostly looking for um, higher, uh, high level hierarchy papers like systematic reviews, meta-analysis, randomized controlled trial. So the work of, you know, uh, case studies, retrospective studies, case reports, etc., etc., is almost out of question. So the initial uh, authors who have started uh, in their career writing uh, are totally discouraged going to any high impact journal for obvious reasons. And uh, most of the initial authors in India don't have access to good uh, similarity checker or plagiarism checker and hence they get into trap of uh, uh, duplicity and their paper gets rejected and last but not the least is most of the good journals like yourself have started asking for um, APC uh, which is quite high and is almost unaffordable by most authors in India because uh, most of the authors do not get any grant from their institution and universities. So I would like you to help us in, in these matters so that we can um, uh, send our papers to good journals like yourself. Okay, I'll try to address as many of those points as I can and let me know if I miss some. Uh, first of all, uh, I think the first thing you asked about was the English language. Yes. Uh, Personally, I would say I think many reviewers place too much emphasis on the details of the English language, frankly. Uh, I actually have a degree in English literature, and for some reason, uh, little discrepancies with grammar and syntax and uh, uh, even word selection don't seem to bother me too much. As long as I can understand what the authors are saying, uh, I know that our copy editors will correct uh, problems of grammar. The Correct. only thing that I really are concerned about is when, if I can't really understand uh, what the authors really wanted to say. But most of the time, it's just that, I don't know, reviewers seem to like to pick up on the fact that they can detect that the uh, authors weren't native English speakers. But the funny thing is they often say this about people that are native English speakers. Uh, many papers we get from America or from the United Kingdom uh, will get comments like this, even though the authors are native English speakers. But my, my suggestion is 
uh, to remember what I was talking about, polishing it up. Certainly, uh, the number the three number three recommendation I gave you there was to give it to someone who is an English writer. Now, it doesn't have to be somebody who's a doctor or a scientist. It could be somebody who just has a really good knowledge of English. Maybe they're an English teacher. Uh, they may not understand all the scientific jargon that you have in there, but they'll usually be able to tell you whether there are areas where the grammar isn't correct or the word order, the syntax is not correct. So that's one thing you can do that doesn't require a professional editor who I know would be very expensive that will help polish up your paper. Now, I can't speak for all editors, but I, as I said, as an editor myself, uh, I don't reject the paper uh, just because there may be some uh, minor mistakes in grammar or word selection. Uh, it can be a problem if it's just difficult to understand what's going on, but uh, that's really at the extreme. Uh, the next thing I think you talked about certain study designs like case reports uh, that may not be accepted by all journals. This is definitely true. Uh, I would say, though, if you look at the statistics, even though in journals uh, that are highly rated like AJSM or OJSM, where we certainly like publishing randomized trials, there's still a relatively small part of the papers that we publish. Uh, so a good case series can still be accepted, especially if they uh, explore uh, uh, interesting topics and they're well done with little loss to follow up and lots of interesting details. Now, there's certain uh, areas uh, such as things that might be more experimental, uh, like use of biologics, uh, PRP or stem cells, uh, where there's a lot of hype going on in the world. And there, uh, most of the time, we do like to see some sort of comparison group or control uh, because uh, otherwise it's really hard to tell whether this biologic is helping or not. Now, to get back to the idea of the case reports, as I mentioned uh, before, it's selecting the journal. Make sure if you have a case report or a technique paper that it's a journal that will accept that type of paper. That will reduce your chance of being disappointed. Now, I can tell you at AJSM and OJSM, just for example, we don't have an absolute prohibition on case reports, but we really only publish a few, maybe one or two a year in AJSM. So if you do submit a case report to a journal that only rarely publishes them, don't be too discouraged if you get a rejection. There are some case report journals, and that's probably a good place to start. Uh, or you might just select a journal that does publish case reports. Uh, it may not have the highest impact factor, but it may be one that uh, might be appropriate for your case report. I feel a little bit like a hypocrite because if you look at my CV, I actually years ago published two case reports in AJSM that I don't know if myself today as editor I would have accepted, but you know, uh, literature moves on and improves and we keep raising our standards. Uh, there was a question about APCs. Uh, these are uh, article processing charges and they usually refer to open access journals. Uh, it costs money to publish a journal. We pay our employees, of course, uh, and they have to have some income so they can feed their families. Uh, a subscription journal uh, makes money uh, by charging for subscriptions uh, from individuals and especially from institutions uh, such as libraries and universities. Uh, an open access journal doesn't charge for subscriptions. Uh, the material is freely accessible. And so most open access journals do uh, try to offset their costs with article processing charges. Now, most open access journals will have lower, reduced charges uh, for people uh, from World Bank, uh, lower middle or lower income countries. 
And I do know that India is uh, classified by the World Bank as a lower middle income country. And that's why uh, for OJSM, our charges are just one third of the regular charge. Uh, nevertheless, that can be an obstacle, I understand. Uh, and if it is, then obviously you would want to concentrate on a subscription type journal that doesn't uh, have article processing charges. In the future, we certainly would hope that uh, open access journals as they become more mainstream uh, would have more and more advertising and this would help offset and maybe even reduce article processing charges. I can tell you that there is a big uh, movement afoot, particularly in Europe, called Plan S uh, to try to force all journals to become open access. Uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, currently putting a lot of pressure on publishers of subscription journals to make deals with different countries, mostly European countries, uh, to publish all their papers open access in return for a certain fee that the usually it's the, a university consortium of that country pays to the publisher. So I think you will see in the coming years more and more open access uh, happening. And it's possible that other countries outside of Europe will also join in this movement. Uh, Thank you, Bruce, for your elaborate answers. Uh, any more questions? Yeah, just along, Dr. Ida, along the lines of this open access journal, there is a question from the chat, and I would just try to rephrase it a little, that in your view, would the impact factor of a subscribed journal be uh, superior to an open access journal in the present day? I think that depends upon the particular journal. Uh, as you may know, I'm very proud of the fact that OJSM is one of the few open access orthopedic journals that has an open, that has an impact factor. And actually it's quite a good one. Uh, it's in the upper third, almost the upper quarter of orthopedic journals and higher than many subscription journals, uh, such as the journal, the Journal of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery. OJSM actually has a higher impact factor than JAAOS, and it's only one notch below the Journal of Elbow, Elbow and Shoulder Surgery. So there are some open access journals that have quite high impact factor. Although the ones at the very top, like AJSM, tend to be subscription journals. Um, I think this is something that will continue to change over time. And that's one of the reasons that we started OJSM, because uh, years ago, when we started planning it in 2012 and publishing it in 2013, we thought that open access would be something that would become more and more important and maybe take over scientific publishing in the future. Great. Bruce, one of the major advantages quoted for open access journal is that they have more readership and more probable citations. But it has been recently shown that the citations go up only by 10 to 20 percent more in open access than non-open access journal. So do you think it, it is a major advantage of getting uh, your work published in open access just for this reason? The effect on readership is very dramatic. I have a slide that I often show. It shows the top 10 articles from AJSM in terms of number of downloads compared with the top 10 from OJSM. And you know, I'm very proud of AJSM, but because it's a, it's a subscription journal, the downloads are limited to people who have access to subscriptions. And I can tell you that the top 10 articles from OJSM have twice as many downloads as the top 10 articles from HSM. So in terms of downloads, the effect is quite dramatic. In terms of citations, I think the effect is less so. You're absolutely right. It's certainly not twice as many. It's probably incremental. Uh, so one of the big advantages of open access is to have a much wider readership and maybe a wider clinical impact. Uh, 
As far as citations, I think there is some advantage, but I agree with Dr. Raju completely, not as dramatic as the advantage in downloads. Great. Now, while we are at the OJSM, Dr. Ryder, uh, suppose if the article submitted to the OJSM is recommended by the editorship to submit in the OJSM, does the author have a certain time period within which uh, he or she has to decide? Because it might be that they might want to try another journal, uh, and then if it gets rejected, then perhaps uh, submit it or get accepted by the OJSM, for example. So is there a time frame? Well, I think as with any revision, it's always better to submit it as soon as possible because the revision may come outdated. I can tell you, uh, papers that we refer to OJSM from AJSM, we call cascades. Uh, many of them are submitted within a week or two. Okay. Some are submitted. Some are submitted six months later, and you know we suspect that the authors may have tried another subscription journal before sending it to OJSM. Uh, we don't downgraded just because of that. But if it starts to get where it's a year later or, you know, more, the paper may ju not just be that important anymore, you know? Other papers may have appeared. So in general, I recommend that you submit the revision as any revision as quickly as possible. One of the advantages for such papers is that we treat them as revisions at, at OJSM because of the close connection of the two journals. So we don't normally send a cascade paper out for other reviews. So the revision process is very fast. Now I can tell you that since we have an impact factor, we actually get more papers directly submitted to OJSM now than cascade papers. So we have both types of submissions. Great. Now, one question on statistical analysis. Now, I don't know uh, what what the general audience feels, but that is one of the hurdles which we face in trying to get a medical uh, statistician back here in India. Now, uh, I understand that obviously the results have to be valid uh, validated with proper statistic ana analysis. So, suppose if the uh, content of the paper and the results and the outcome are good, does the journal offer assistance in uh, some uh, amendments in statistical analysis rather than just reject it for that reason? I think it depends. Uh, we certainly expect a certain degree of valid statistical analysis. Now our reviewers will often offer uh, recommendations for improving the analysis or changing the analysis. So that's one way. And we do have an assistant editor for statistics, David Landy, who is a very unusual individual because he's an orthopedic surgeon and he has a PhD in statistics. There aren't too many people like that out there, so we're very lucky to have him. Uh, we mainly refer the more complicated uh, statistical analyses to him uh, to make sure that he agrees they've been properly done, and if he doesn't, he will offer recommendations on what needs to be done. Uh, but uh, it's always better, if you can, to have either a statistician or at least someone who knows statistics uh, to review and help you plan the statistics of your paper. Often it might be somebody who's not an orthopedic surgeon. Interestingly, some of our reviewers that are the most knowledgeable about statistics are not orthopedic surgeons. They're athletic trainers or physical, physical therapists who maybe have doctorates in their field. And part of their training is to have intense education in statistics. So often they're some of the most astute uh, reviewers as far as statistics go. And conversely, as an author, you might think about bringing somebody in who might not, you know, be a professional statistician, but might be in a field, maybe a basic science, where they've been trained more in proper statistical analysis 
and can give you some advice. Thank you. Just one question. Um, do you always uh, want all the systematic reviews and RCTs to be registered? Uh, or do you also consider unregistered uh, papers on these? The answers are no and yes. We don't require, at least at this point, our editorial board always is considering new things, but at this point, we don't require that systematic reviews be registered. But we do require that any randomized trial that was begun after January 1st, 2016 has to be registered before the actual trial is begun and the patients are enrolled. Sundar? Yeah, my question is to Mr. Reader. I think it's a wonderful presentation and a lot of clarifications which we have today. Uh, when you submit the paper for like a high impact journal like AJSM, how do you weigh the paper? Do you weigh more for uh, a cadaveric or biomechanical studies over clinical studies? Well, regarding AJSM and OJSM too, um, we think of ourselves as primarily a clinical journal. So we definitely emphasize clinical studies and we never want the basic studies to take us over, so to speak. Um, we do have uh, a couple of editors that specifically address some of the basic or laboratory studies. Uh, Braden Fleming is a PhD bioengineer, uh, so he evaluates the biomechanical studies. And Scott Rodeo uh, is an orthopedic surgeon, but he's also a basic researcher, and he evaluates the basic biologic studies. So they oh, have always been kind of uh, an important part of AJSM, but we always feel that the clinical studies are the most important. So we always look to emphasize them. Thank you. Anybody else who's joined us? Any questions? Bruce, as a friend of uh, Indian Arthroscopic Society, I would like uh, to know how can you help Indian Arthroscopic Society and young surgeons in, in their quest to do research and publication? Well, thank you. Uh, it has been a pleasure to have a friendship with the Indian Arthroscopy Society, and I hope we continue doing that. Uh, to answer your question, I always am very open and available uh, for individuals or organizations that are trying to nurture their journals. And I can tell you, I won't mention any of the names of the journals, but a number of editors of other journals who you would recognize or societies uh, that are trying to develop their journals uh, have asked me for my advice. I just yeah. did a conference call with another society uh, leadership uh, a week or two ago about this very matter. Uh, so I'm always available for any insights I can give to Dr. Raju or the society board or the journal board uh, for any hints. You know, I've been an editor now for almost 20 years. I'm still learning. I'm always learning. That's the important to be. You know, we never stop learning. But I have learned quite a few things along the way. Uh, and I'm happy to share my insights uh, and uh, the things I've learned that help uh, in the development of a journal, which is a very challenging thing to do. I can tell you, having developed some new journals, I can tell you it's a major undertaking uh, and uh, it's not always guaranteed success, but uh, it's also a very exciting and exhilarating thing to do. So I think uh, you should be very excited about the journal. That there are ways that I can contribute with uh, advice maybe uh, I'm happy to do so. I'm happy to be a resource uh, for you, Dr. Raju, or any of the other members of the board, uh, certainly. And if there are ways that with the time I have available, I can help. Thanks a lot. Perhaps one of the suggestions, if uh, you agree, Dr. Ryder, would be to perhaps include 
the content of a talk which you've just given into the journal. So, you know, that sets a trend and it also encourages good research and good uh, writing skills uh, for, for various uh, young surgeons, really. So, that in that way, if you can, perhaps you can contribute uh, to the journal. If you think that would be helpful, I'm humbled and I would be... Yeah, okay, I will write to you. Thank you. Uh, Any question from, from Bill? William Morrell. Unmute no, yourself. No, I don't have any questions, but uh, I'd just like to thank Dr. Ryder for sharing his time uh, and expertise. And it was very elucidating talk. And uh, and I think sometimes I may write him to get uh, some suggestions and help as well. So thanks for inviting me. So uh, if there are no further questions, then I will just conclude by saying that personally and on behalf of Dr. Raju Vaishya and the Indian Arthroscopy Society, we are very, very grateful, Dr. Bruce Ryder, uh, for uh, taking time off in this busy period of the year and delivering really such a wonderful talk, which is like a father talking to his son. It was a very, very stepwise uh, approach and offered clear understanding to anybody out there who's interested in research. So we, from the deepest uh, part of our heart, we uh, acknowledge your time and effort and thank you very much for your participation. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful to be part of this and to have your, your friendship. Uh, you you uh, can only imagine how meaningful it is to me. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for us to a, a strong association. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Rita. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rita. Uh, dear friends, our next webinar is on 23rd uh, June. Uh, it's the fourth series on basic arthroscopy series by none other than our Dr. Uh, Jitendra Maheshwari. Uh, Dr. Rajnesh and Dr. Prathmesh Jain will be the panelist. So, see you all on 23rd at 7 o'clock. It will be on complications in arthroscopy. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.